laid off from my job just shy of my 20th anniversary with GE. We got sued for $5 million for a car accident my wife had been in three years earlier. I found out that my 17-year-old son was going to make me a grandpa. And on top of that, I was at least 75 pounds overweight and had a lot of health issues. Once the scale started reading 230, I quit stepping on it. Just I couldn't stand looking at the number anymore. At a minimum, I lost 75 pounds. I don't think you can live in this country without that being ingrained in you. Fat makes you fat. Cholesterol is bad. I have an animal every day. I think the lack of sustainability is a, a myth that's been created by people that are actually opposed to the whole notion of keto rather than things that keto people say. So I've got with me, I'm very happy to actually talk to, to talk to Steve because I, I'd actually watched a lot of your videos over the years uh, a while back and I was really uh, enjoyed those a little bit. But Steve, you're with, it's called, is it, it a serious keto or something along that? I can't remember yep, the name. That's, yeah. That is right. the name of the channel. So tell, tell us a little about your background before so then maybe how you got into all this stuff. The journey started in late 2018. 2018 was a very rough year for me all around. I had gotten laid off from my job just shy of my 20th anniversary with GE. We got sued for $5 million for a car accident my wife had been in three years earlier. I found out that my 17-year-old son was going to make me a grandpa. There was just a, a lot of things going on. And on top of that, I was at least 75 pounds overweight and had a lot of health issues as a result. And I more or less hit a point, it was Thanksgiving weekend, where I just, I said enough is enough. I got to get control of my life, and I'm going to start by getting control of my diet. And I had just read the book Presto by Penn Gillette and how he had lost 100 pounds going vegan. So I thought, I'll give this a try. I didn't enjoy it <laughs> at all. But uh, over the course of eight weeks, I started researching, what should I do? What should be my long-term lifestyle for rest of my life way of eating. And I looked in the, at a number of different low carb options, but wound up settling in on keto because it allowed for dairy and I'm in Wisconsin. So had to have the dairy. And uh, from there proceeded to lose at least 75 pounds. I'm, I'm not sure how much I lost because once the scale started reading 230, I quit stepping on it. Just, I couldn't stand looking at the number anymore. So at a minimum, I lost 75 pounds got off a bunch of different medications, got my body free from inflammation, and started feeling the best I've felt since my 20s. Interesting. And so I'm just just back up on the little pendulette, I guess, plant-based vegan experiment. What? How, you said you didn't enjoy it. What were you doing? What didn't you enjoy about that, I guess? Well, I, I have mixed feelings about the, the first part of it, which is basically a potato fast is how he started. And in a way, yeah. that was good in that it, it really recalibrated my taste buds. I'd been eating so much of the standard American diet that I didn't know what sweet meant anymore. And I think from that standpoint, it prepared me to go keto in that I didn't have sweet cravings really anymore. But just in general, I, I feel better eating meat. It's, it's as simple as that. I felt weak, a uh, little bit lightheaded, and I just, I, I enjoy cow a lot. So going without meat for eight weeks, I was not a lot of fun for me. Yeah, I can imagine. It's interesting you talk about recalibrating your taste buds because I was a guy that, man, I, the desserts could not be sweet enough for me. I'd give, give me the sweetest thing and other, even other people that were like normal would eat because my God, that's sweet. And I'm like, give me the whole damn pie. I'm a pretty big guy as well. And now because I basically don't eat sweets anymore, I'm literally Anything even the slightest bit sweet seems very noticeable. You can tell. Now, I often joke that I can taste the blood glucose in my saliva now sometimes. And I'm sitting, literally, I'm sitting here like this. I can taste a sweet taste <laughs> in my mouth. My blood glucose, I've got a CGM right now. It's 81. So it's okay. I'm tasting that perhaps. And your saliva does have sugar in it, by the way, if people didn't know that. So, you know, that obviously wasn't for you. But your diet prior to that, when you were at least 70, 80 pounds overweight, what did that consist of? Had you ever given diet a thought prior to that other than, what tastes good? I had gone through a little bit of a diet roller coaster over my adult life. Most of my adult life, I was overweight. And there was a lot of Taco Bell in my diet, a lot of beer in my diet. And I tried Atkins back around 25 years ago and, and had done that briefly. 
and, and lost some weight. But for the most part, it, it was just a lot of junk food, a lot of pizza, a lot of fast food, and uh, a lot of carbs. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a pretty common. I, I, well, I think that's probably when I think about how most people determine what they eat, it's what's, what tastes good and how much does it cost. That's probably the decision making of probably close to 90, 95% plus of the population on how they decide that. Obviously, you're low carb, and I'm not sure what your diet is say, at least keto, I'm sure. But had you ever been like taught that, hey, saturated fat is bad for you, cholesterol is, we don't want to, had that ever been ingrained in you like oh, it yeah. is in I most mean, people? It's, I don't think you can live in this country without that being ingrained in you. Fat makes you fat. Cholesterol is bad. And it's still, it's pushed on us every single day. I guess there's this new documentary on Netflix all about how uh, veganism is so much better for you and the planet. And I can't even bring myself to watch that. I think it'll just irritate me. But yeah, that's what, what we get from the healthcare industry and and mainstream media. So it's hard not, it's the first time I had a steak on keto and I'm like, I'm going to eat all this fat. I really felt conflicted because you still have that voice in the back of your head saying, oh, well, this is so bad for you. But I got over that. Yeah, I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit I did watch that documentary because so many people asked me to, to, to comment on that. And again, it was basically plant-based propaganda for sure, undoubtedly, with all the sort of tricks they did with the other one, the game changes, same sort of, same people made the movie more or less. And so you don't need to watch it for sure. It's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to inspire you in any way other than just make you shake your head at the ridiculousness of it. So as you got into keto, because let me ask you, because you've been very on your channel, you're almost scientific. I'll use that word with how you approach food and how do you, you're doing reviews and I think comp comparisons, I think you're maybe blood glucose things and stuff like that. How did you decide to go put all this stuff out there on social media? I, I felt like I was going to be doing this anyway. I was going to start trying to develop keto recipes. And really one of the big complaints you hear about keto is, oh, it's so restrictive. And I wanted to show that it didn't have to be, that you could have a, a very enjoyable and fulfilling diet. And so, I, and I've always been into the whole kitchen chemistry thing, molecular gastronomy and things like that. I just, I, it tickles the scientific part of my brain. And then at some point, fairly early on, Keto Mojo had reached out to me and said, hey, how would you like our ketone and blood glucose monitor? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll try it. And then I started getting curious about a lot of the like zero net carb breads or tortillas or things out there and wanted to see if they were legit. And initially I was using the Keto Mojo and doing the finger pricks and that gets old. So I was very pleased when I finally got around to uh, having a continuous glucose monitor. Because then also you get so much more in the way of data. And I wanted to show that on the channel. I do try and let people know that uh, this is at best pseudoscience. I'm a sample size of one. And just because something doesn't spike my blood glucose doesn't necessarily mean it won't spike yours. But if it does spike mine, that's a pretty big red flag. So I try and do it as a bit of a public service, but I want to make sure that it, it's couched in the reality that I'm just one person. And even these devices, these are not $6,000 blood glucose monitors. The FDA has a fairly loose set of rules for how accurate these things need to be. So understand that there's a little bit of floatiness as well in, in some of the measurements, but that's just, that's my disclaimer that I try and give people. Let me, let me just back up to, because when you lost all the weight, what were the benefits that you saw eating more fat and reducing carbohydrates? Did you notice a significant, obviously you lost some weight and people argue just calorie deficit, you can do it losing on any diet, fair enough. But did you notice specific uh, benefits outside of that? Some of it comes with weight loss regardless, but what, what are I your mean, thoughts on that? There's what I will do periodically on my podcast. Uh, I will notice something that has changed in, in the past five years since when I was pre-keto. And then I'll mention it and people are like, whoa, yeah, I noticed that too. Things like I don't get canker sores. I don't get bit my, by mosquitoes. I rarely fart. It's just, it doesn't happen. And, and when it does, it's all bark and no bite. But the biggest thing, the absolute biggest thing, and I just, I bang this drum an awful lot when I'm talking about the benefits of a low carb, high fat lifestyle, inflammation 
going away. People don't, when you mention inflammation, most people don't know what it is until you just say anything that has the word itis or the suffix uh, itis on it. So tendonitis, arthritis, you name it, that goes away. And it is such a great feeling. And then I'll try one of these supposedly keto products that has one of these seed oils in it, soybean oil, canola oil, whatever. And again, I start feeling it in my knuckles. I start feeling it in my knees. I feel it through like my intercostal muscles along along the back. I'm like, ooh, I, this is not the way I want to feel. It's the way I used to feel and I thought was normal. And now I realize it's not. So definitely the lack of inflammation is just, it's a life changer. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to say, because it's one thing to check in your blood glucose if it goes in up or down. What, what does it actually mean? There's some people say, hey, it's innocuous. If it goes up a little bit. Who cares? This is other people say it's dangerous to have people that aren't diabetics wearing CGNs because they're going to get the wrong message. But it's interesting that you say that I can eat a food and, and I notice I feel worse. Either my gut feels worse or my joints inflame or something like that. Are you seeing a correlation between the foods that spike your blood glucose and the ones that make you feel weird in the joints or no? No, I've pretty much narrowed it down to the oils because I've tried some of these products that have various, they'll say resistant wheat starch or wheat protein or things like that, or gluten. I don't feel any effects from that, but I, that's an individual thing. Some people are going to feel effects from that. To me, it, it's almost always the highly processed seed oils that get me. And when I test these products, I don't go out and carb binge or anything like that. But the handful of times that I have been off of keto, having a, a cheat day or going on, uh, going on vacation, there is a feeling like a, a low grade hangover. And you just, I, I find myself feeling a, a lack of both energy and motivation. I just feel rather blah after a high carb day. And again, I don't like feeling that way. So I try and avoid those as much as possible. Yeah, as people ask me, why do I stay pretty strict on my diet? I'm like, because I feel better. I, that, that's really why I do. I don't have any particular ideologic goal here. It's just, this is how I feel better. And it's really interesting uh, to see that. What pers There are a lot of low-carb keto products out there now. You can't go through a store and not see 100 labels with keto this, keto that, because, because it's been very popular. What percentage of them you think are worth a darn? Are, are most of them just junk from what you've seen? There, there are, I would actually got a spreadsheet of just all the tortillas I've tried sitting next to me because <laughs> people ask me about that and they ask me about the breads. In terms of tortillas, I would say 10% I've tried that have been, that I, I've experienced no, or, or a fairly stable glucose response. I still tell people, just because you have a, a stable glucose response, they may still be fighting against your goals. And when people tell me, oh, I've stalled on keto, I'm not losing any weight. My first question is, are you eating keto? I, I got to get my hands closer together here. I have the camera panned in too far. Keto breads or tortillas? And they say, yeah. And I say, well, there's your problem. Probably cut those out. And wait until you are at a maintenance weight and then use them periodically as a treat. But I think that's, I think the biggest danger to, to keto and its reputation is these commercial products that aren't really keto. And so people try it, they think they're doing keto and they're not experiencing the benefits of keto, including the weight loss. And then they say keto doesn't work. And it's not the keto that's not working. It's the products that are labeled perhaps falsely keto or zero net carb or, or whatever. Breads are a tough one. There's no perfect keto bread out there. If you're, if you, your best is to get two out of the four criteria of price, taste, ingredients, and doesn't spike your glucose. Uh, there's, I don't think I've even found one that hits three out of those four. I've seen some people make homemade stuff that might be more you're talking about off the shelf stuff. There's probably some homemade products that do this. I've seen people make bread out of chicken and make bread yeah. out of egg white powder, different things that, that, that people have done. And I, I assume you're not talking about, have you tried any of those types of things where you made your own I, homemade I have, stuff? Too? And to me, the egg white bread that was briefly popular to me, that's, it's like eating memory foam. I just, I'm not into the texture at all. I've tried some of the other recipes. The, the thing is, I just, I don't, eat enough 
bread or don't crave bread often enough that making my own is even worth the time. In fact, I buy when I buy a loaf of keto bread to do a review on, it's probably going to sit in my freezer for about six months. And I'm having a slice a week or something like that. So they last forever for me. Can you, let me say, okay, so you said 2018, I think. So this is like six, almost six years ago or something. So, uh, yeah, 2018 is when I, just, I did the vegan thing at the end of the year. My five year ketoversary, I think, is March 16th. Okay. So coming up on five years. Has that changed? One of the things, I'm obviously an advocate of a carnivore diet. And a lot of people within the keto space have certainly added more meat to their diet over the last really about five years since you've been doing it. Has that been something that you've noticed as well? Is that part of your diet where you've increased your meat consumption or has it always been about Yeah, it, it, I have an animal every day. And <laughs> one of the things that I talk about, because there is a lot of tribalism out there in the whole keto spectrum from dirty, lazy keto up to, to carnivore. And I try and be really pragmatic and, and welcoming and non-judgmental and if someone decides they want to get in on the, the dirty keto end of the spectrum and they start feeling the benefits, I think there's this natural transition to getting closer and closer to carnivore. There are a lot of days where probably the only carbs I consume are the heavy whipping cream in my coffee in, in the morning and, and whatever seasoning I add to, to my steak at night. There are other days that are a little more carby, but I think it's a pretty rare occasion that I would go over 20 total grams of carbs in, in, in any given day. And I used to be higher. I was, I was counting net carbs and I, I've, I know that I was definitely probably closer to 50 or more grams of total carbs, but I think you just, at least for me, my palate changed, my appetite changed, what I was interested in eating changed. And I think I've crept a little bit closer to, to carnivore over the years. That's interesting. And this is what I hear a lot of people, because a lot of people, when they, particularly when you approach them with hey, a potential carnivore, they're like, oh my God, I can never give up X, Y, and Z bread. Or mm -hmm. they, But the weird thing is over time, you just stop craving things. I just watched a criticism by Chris Gardner at Stanford saying why he never thinks a carnivore study will ever be done. Although I'm literally organizing him right now as we're speaking. He's saying that, can you imagine going to a coffee shop and all they have is pastries and you can't get meat? Well, yeah, I can imagine I'd go somewhere else. I go to the Denny's and order steak and eggs or something like that if I wanted to do that. It's not that hard. But it's interesting how one of the things when I did keto, because before doing carnivore, when I started carnivore, I'm in my eighth year of this now, I did keto for a couple of years. And one of the things that, that really just changed my perception was the lack of hunger that I'd had for the first time in my life because I was a, a big guy, athlete, ate all the time, always hungry, always stuff in my face. It was in part so I could perform, but I'm always hungry. And then I went keto and I was like, wait a minute, I'm not even hungry for the lunch. So like the first in my life, I didn't want to eat lunch because like, I'm full from breakfast. Do you still notice that for you? Is that something that you oh, yeah. did that? Did that Was that apparent to you? Yeah. And, and it's great not being a, a slave to, to food that way. You just, I don't have snack attacks. I don't get hungry. And I'm not afraid to, to stop eating once I'm satisfied. When, when you're eating something like rice or bread or tortilla chips, you'll just keep going and going. It just it doesn't seem to trigger any sort of satisfaction or satiety. Whereas if I'm eating a, a ribeye, I'll, I'll get to a point where I'm like, mm, you know what? I'm satisfied. I'm not full, but I'm satisfied. I can stop eating right now and feel fine. And that's... That I think has been a big change for me from versus pre keto. I would just, I would eat until my plate was clean. And if my kids still had food on their plates, I would say, scrape those onto dad's plate. And now that just, I, I can't imagine eating that much anymore. Do you ever get, obviously, when you're, when you got there and say, Hey, I'm testing all these foods, you probably get requests. Hey, test this crazy. Pro <laughs> Were there any products that you tested? You're like, Oh man, I don't really want to test this stuff, but you did just for the sake of science, any of those types of things? So actually, it's more like demands than it is requests. People are not entirely <laughs> polite on the internet. But there there have been, I, I've, I've essentially announced on the channel, listen, from now on, if I pick up a package and I see soybean oil or canola oil, I'm not reviewing that product. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. There, there have been a few things that I've tried that really I didn't care for. I don't want to get in trouble with anybody, but the unbun products I can't, I just, I can't eat those anymore. It's, 
I would rather just take a big spoonful of silly musk and put it in my mouth because that's what it's like, but chewier. Sounds appetizing. No. <laughs> no, I think I, because I, I, I remember there's a period of time where I kind of binge watch some of your stuff. It's been a, a little while, but I think you're, I think you're involving your daughter at one point. Was that, do I remember that right? Your daughter was. I'll, I'll try and include the family wherever I can, just to, so it's not the complete Steve show. Get, get a few guests in there. And also I'm the only one that's keto in my family. So when I'm trying out a product, my bias is going to lean towards my new keto taste buds in terms of how sweet it is, or do I even remember what this particular food tastes like? So having my wife or my daughter or my grandson try something out and give their impression, I, th I think it, it's, you get a little bit more out of the channel. Yeah, fair enough. Cause you're trying to pass this off as a keto version of dessert or a bread or pancake i don't know, I think i saw you making pancakes at one time if i'm not mistaken you probably i'm sure you probably yeah, made i made a, a a nearly carnivore pancake with pork rinds and everybody thinks oh my gosh that sounds so disgusting and then they try it and they're like wow this actually tastes like a pancake how did that happen yeah i try and throw a little love to to my carnivore viewers from time to time yeah, pancakes can sometimes. I have had I I haven't had pancakes in a long time, but pancakes can sometimes have a little bit of a salty, buttery play. And obviously, you, you throw the syrup on there, and it gives you that salty, sweet type of taste. So I can see where the pork rinds would maybe impart a bit of that. And then I don't know about texturally. Obviously, texture is important when you eat as well. But so yeah, it's interesting because my no one in my family is carnivore, but my spouse is pretty carnivore. Actually, this month she's actually done carnivore, true legit carnivore for the first time ever. And she's already, she's 22 days into it for the month and she's actually feeling great. She, mm -hmm. She's still, she, her di normal diet is meat plus a little bit of cheese and a little bit of, of, of fruit. She's from France and she likes her cheese. And so she just dropped the fruit this month for the first time. She's basically, well, there's a little bit of carbohydrate in, in dairy, obviously, but she's, I feel really good and her mood's been better. So that's good. So it's good for the, good for her. Not that she's in a bad mood normally, but she's just really happy right now. So that's really fun to well, see. And continuing on that, there was at some point, I think it might've been on your Instagram, you, you put a little clip of one of my podcasts where I was talking about carnivores and like how they always seem to be in a good mood. And oh, yeah, I remember that a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's wow. Th that's changed a little bit, at least in terms of some of the comments that I get from carnivores. There are some out there that are, are pretty overzealous and self-righteous, but I think you see that in any way of eating. There are some people that get overly excited about it, but yeah, it, it used to be that all the comments I got from carnivores were just super chill. They weren't preachy. They're like, Hey, if you think you feel good on keto, why not just try, try carnivore, give it a shot for a couple of weeks and see how you feel really low pressure. Yeah, it's almost like rooting for a sports team. You got the, what are the New York Jets fans where they get whatever. I can characterize any different the Oakland Raiders. They get really like, my, my way is the best way. And I'm not like that. I'm like, hey, man, do what works for you. And I'm happy to have people be, I'm even happy. If somebody's a vegan and they do better, I don't care. As long as they're getting healthier. I'm not, it's not for me. And I think there's some whole problems with that particular way of dieting. The biggest problem is the advocates tend to be, like you said, really preachy and condescending to anyone else, which is a real problem I have with that particular group. But so as far as have you learned, obviously, okay, let me add, this is a question because it always comes up. Aren't you worried about your cholesterol going up on eating all this fat and, and is it killing you? How many heart attacks have you had? I don't, I don't know how old you are, Steve, but clearly you've probably had at least three heart attacks by now, correct or no? So yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be 56 here in, in March and no heart attacks yet. Wow, and I was... Similar to what you had talked about before, just the constant pounding of, the, of this message of fat makes you fat, cholesterol is bad, and, and so on. I was concerned about the physical that I had today and the, the lipid panel. And then I watched a number of different videos that really explained in a way that I felt I could have a, an intelligent conversation with my primary care physician about how pointless statins are, how the Jupiter study that claims that you're 54% less likely to have a heart attack if you're on a statin, how those are relative numbers. It's that 54% is the difference between a 0.76% chance of having a heart attack and a 0.35% chance of that. It's probably within the margin of error. And then you've got all the different side effects to it. Similarly, I forget who it was that I watched. It might've been Paul Saladino who was talking about the, I think it's the, is it the Framingham risk study? 
And if you segment that cohort by HDL levels, you no longer see that slope of as your LDL increases, so does your risk of coronary artery disease. If you segment segment that and you show the people that have just moderate to high HDL, suddenly that line is just flat, regardless of how much LDL they have. So after watching a, a couple of those videos, I felt a lot more comfortable having that conversation with my doctor. It turned out not to be necessary because my LDL was near perfect. My HDL was pretty high, triglycerides pretty low. So he was he was quite happy with that. Yeah, we're discovering, I think we're going to find out and we are finding out that there's a lot more nuance to this discussion than just high LDL, always bad. I think that's, I think that's going to be shown to not be the case. Studies are in yeah, progress. I, I hope we get to a point where we start looking at legitimate markers like metabolic health hmm. instead of some of these things where they just take a number in isolation, like they keyed in on LDL and that's all they look at. And they don't look at any other factors. And then they want to write you a prescription for a statin. And right, right. it's, I spent the majority of my career working in and around the healthcare industry. And so I've seen behind the curtain, as I'm sure you have. And that's why I call it an industry. It is a business between pharma and the medical community. One of the things, one of the many criticisms levied at low carb diets and general ketogenic diets and certainly carnivore diets is it's just not sustainable. No one can do it for more than you can do it short term, six weeks, two months, and then you're off of it. What are your thoughts on sustainability? I've been doing it for almost five years. So I would say it's pretty sustainable. Halle Berry has been doing it for 30 years. She's looking great. I think it used to like when I did Atkins and base, there weren't YouTube wasn't here yet there weren't a bunch of recipes. The recipes for, for low carb were essentially whatever was in Dr. Atkins book. And yeah, that, that got boring, but I think there have been a lot of content creators. And I'm, I'm proud to be one of them that has found that you can make an awful lot of great food that is keto or low carb. It, we've got more in the way of ingredients that we can use now. And then we just, we've got this community that I think is very creative in, in coming up with recipes. So I, I don't find it restrictive at all. I think when people say restrictive, it goes back to what you said previously. Oh, I can, I couldn't live without potatoes, rice, beer, whatever it is. And that was me for a long time. Now I just, I have no interest in it. I don't, I, I don't look at a potato or a French fry or anything like that and say, oh, I miss that so much. So I think I think the lack of sustainability is a, a myth that's been created by people that are actually opposed to the whole notion of keto rather than things that keto people say. Yeah. And while I'm not really a fan of a lot of people eating, I don't know, faux desserts, I try to people just eat a, eat a food, don't do that. But there are people that, hey, I want to make a dessert or something like that occasionally, once in a while, maybe on my birthday or something like that. And there are a lot of different, as you said, new ingredients. And one people like to often talk about are sweeteners, artificial, whatever, non-nutritive sweeteners, stevias, monk fruits, allulose, you know, erythritol, all, 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 yes, there are many of them. Have you had experience with those, tested those, and have found some to be superior than others? What is your thought on that? They, none of them act truly like sugar in terms of cooking. Things like erythritol will crystallize better. So if you're doing some recipe where you need something to crystallize or a, a cookie that you want to have be hard or crunchy or crumbly, then it's erythritol. The issue I have with erythritol is I really get the, the cooling effect in my mouth from it. It's like, I I've, I've always feel like I just had some sugar-free gum or something like that. Whenever I have erythritol, allulose is, I like allulose because it's 60% or less sweeter than, than sugar by, by volume. And so that appeals to me, but it's oh, a little bit of sweet, but not terribly sweet. Allulose is great. If you're trying to caramelize something, but you've got different ingredients, depending on what you're trying to cook, stevia and monk fruit, they are good, I think, as additives potentially to another sweetener used in, in small quantities, because if you ever have pure, straight monk fruit, most monk fruit that people buy is like 90% erythritol and 10% monk fruit. If you ever have pure monk fruit, and I've got a bag of it in my pantry, it reminds me a lot of the taste of a burning tire. 
It's so you need to cut it with something else. And then there's like xylitol. Xylitol causes me really severe GI issues. The the thing is, I'm, you don't see a whole lot of dessert recipes on my channel. There was originally because originally when I was going off a keto, I still had a dessert mentality. Now I don't, like I said before, when I finish, when I'm satisfied from my meal, I stop eating. So there's no need for dessert for me. I'm done. There's no, there's never been a situation where I've ended dinner and thought, oh, you know what this really needs? Some pie. I just, I'm not in that place anymore. Yeah, that's good. I was in that place for a long time. It was like, life's too short, eat dessert first. I used to say that sometimes. I'd, and I would, I'd go to a restaurant and couldn't decide on dessert, so I'd get two or three of them. Because, you know, again, when you're 300 pounds, you can put away a lot of food. So it's one of those things. And now you're right, I just... I really want dessert and I eat a lot of steaks. I'm like, because people ask me, don't you ever, don't you ever have a cheat meal? I say, I eat ribeye steaks every day. I cheat mm -hmm. every day. You know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's funny. Like just about every day I joke about that, but have you, okay. So have there been negatives because, because we always hear there's, you know, you're going to be constipated. You're going to, what are you, heart attack? Obviously you have not a heart attack, but there's a lot of sort of people that are saying, this is what's going to happen to you if you eat keto long term. Have you had any negatives throughout the years or anything you can think of it, net negatives? No, it's been pretty much all positives. I think one of the, one of the issues I had when I had done Atkins is there wasn't a lot of awareness about electrolytes and the keto flu. And I was, I felt pretty weak when I would be out mowing the lawn. I just, I was exhausted by it. And now knowing what I know about electrolytes and making sure that I'm, I'm getting all of my daily minerals. It's just, I, I don't have those issues with the lack of energy, lack of strength. It's none of the keto flu sort of symptoms. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I haven't really had any, no stomach issues. In fact, when I went keto prior to going keto, I was on three daily doses of reflux medication. Mm -hmm. And once I went keto, I was able to get down to, to one daily dose and then I had seen a video by someone else, and this is now like my most popular video on drinking apple cider vinegar to boost your stomach acid so that the lower esophageal sphincter closes and then you don't have the reflux. Because I guess a lot of people, me included, my reflux issue was actually low stomach acid. And so I had to take, I was taking, I was eating Tums like candy, and I was taking three daily doses of reflux medication. And I, I think I had so badly damaged my gut microbiome that when I would have a bowel movement, I would see vitamins in the toilet, like the capsule. Just it wasn't, there wasn't enough acid in my system to dissolve a vitamin. And that's not cool. Yeah, no, no health issues. I wake up in the morning and I don't have morning breath. That's another interesting thing when you're eating carbs. I mentioned before, practically no gas. It's, I'm not trying to pound the drum too heavily here for, for keto, but honestly, I struggle to come up with any negatives. The only negative I think is dealing with some of the, the feedback you get from people that have been told all their lives how bad this is. So you see someone that you haven't seen in years and they say, oh, wow, you look great. What are you doing? And you say keto and they're like, oh, that's so bad for you. If I told yeah, yeah. them I, I started taking heroin, I would get a better response. It is interesting to see how that is. People, the cognitive dissonance, they look at somebody who's obviously doing much better and then they tell you, oh, what you're doing is wrong. I see a question from the audience there about, I don't know if you even consider or, or there's a concept that overconsumption of oxalates, which sometimes occurs on a ketogenic diet, can be problematic for some people. Have you ever given much consideration or thought or has that been something that you're concerned about at all? No, I'm, I try to promote the, the let me figure out how I want to phrase this. I am not the ingredient police. I don't like the ingredient police. I don't like, it's a problem I have with authority. And especially when someone is a self-anointed expert, they, they've watched some other content creator that says, oh, this has got oxalates or phytates or whatever it is. And then they come and they're like, oh, you shouldn't eat that because that's bad for you. The dose makes the poison is my attitude on some of these things. How much do you need to consume for this to truly be bad for you. Is it all right to have a handful of almonds from time to time? I think it is. So yeah, I tend not to be bothered by some of these comments. I 
if I start feeling, I'm pretty in touch with my body and, and how it feels, which is how I you know managed to determine what causes me inflammation. If I start eating something or start feeling some form of discomfort, I'll figure out what it is. And if it winds up being something that is high in oxalates or phytates or, or whatever it is, then I'll, I'll eliminate it from my diet. And what I tell people is it's okay. You should absolutely be the ingredient police for yourself. Know what your body can handle, what your body can tolerate and read the ingredients. But I'll do that for myself as well. Yeah, fair enough. I think mean, absolutely fair enough. Um, did, when you were overweight, did you have any evidence that you maybe were pre-diabetic or metabolic disease? Was there any insulin resistance going on back then? Did you test that? or I, I've never seen that in, in any of my lab work, but it wouldn't have surprised me to see that I was pre-diabetic just because I was not only eating a lot. Basically, my diet, if you watch a football game and look at all the commercials, that was my diet. Pizza, burgers, wings, and beer, and a, a fair amount of... I was a very big fan of the vodka gimlet. So I'm getting vodka and Rose's lime juice, which I'm sure is probably about the most carby substance on the planet. And so I wouldn't have been surprised had that been measured that I would have shown an overly high or at least over average A1C. So when keto first popped on the scene, it's resurgence, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, something I can't remember how long it's been in place, maybe 15 years ago. Protein was really almost vilified in a way to some degree. Protein's going to turn into chocolate cake and really just limit it to really pretty low amounts and really go high on fat and then since that time, there's still people that are in that camp, but there's, I, th I think, equally more people that have gone over to embracing protein a little more than they used to. Is that something you have shifted, or is it all? Have you, are you low protein guy? Or so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm probably uh, towards the higher protein end of of things, and that's the other thing that people get very dogmatic about is the macros and strictly, oh, you can only have this much protein. If you have this much protein, that's not keto. Then how come I keep measuring my ketones on the keto mojo and I'm in nutritional or optimal ketosis? I must be doing it right. And I've also found that the highest my ketones go are when I do an extended fast. So it's not, I'm not consuming fat during a fast. I'm not consuming anything, including carbs. So my argument is basically control your carbs and you'll control your state of ket ketosis. But yeah, I, you, the weird comments you will sometimes get on YouTube where people say that, that protein does, protein turns into sugar once it gets into your body. I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I don't think that's possible. Yeah, speaking of weird comments, I'll, I'll relay one that I got this morning or yesterday, last night that I had a real chuckle over. It was somebody criticizing the fact that my diet, I said, this month I'm eating beef, salt, and water. They said, it's obvious that your diet is deficient because you have to drink water. Because <laughs> he said, because if I eat just fruits, I get plenty of water from my fruits. <laughs> and I just had to laugh that yeah, I'm deficient because I'm forced to drink water. I thought that was quite quite an interesting comment, but yeah, you get some weird stuff for sure. I had one the other day from a vegan telling me how bad keto is and how we as humans should be naturally a herbivore, fruitivore. I didn't realize fruitivore was a word, but the person says, you look at gorillas, all they do is eat plants and fruit and a gorilla can deadlift 1600 pounds. I'm like, I, I didn't even know what to say. I felt like saying, just imagine how much you could lift if you gave them some steak. There you go. You know, but there it's like, there's, there, we are not gorillas. It's, we're not lions, we're humans. And yeah. we need to eat, like you said before, the way that, that best suits our health. And for me, I found that's low carb. I think the frugivore is actually the, the actual scientific term for a fruit eating animal versus a folivore, folivore, which eats a lot of leaves. The argument, and it's funny because you say, well, yeah, a gorilla can get big and strong eating a plant-based diet, but guess what? They have to eat between 40 and 60 pounds of that a day when they take 10 pound bowel movements every day. It's crazy. It's okay. If you want to live that way and you can perhaps do that, it's much more efficient to get it in a more bioavailable package like you will get it in, in meat. But do you find that you said when you started that you're 70, 80 pounds over lit weight, all these crazy kind of bad things that coalesced around your life. Has it made your life better in general? Just by changing your diet, have there been outside of just your own health, has there been it? Some people say their relationships get better, their ability to perform in their given careers improves. Has it generally improved your life outside of just your specific weight and health? It has. I think when you are in good health, 
you're able to handle a lot more in life is my belief. I think you are, it's one, one less weight on your back, you know, figuratively and literally. And that gives you more strength, I believe, to deal with whatever else life throws at you. I think also when you are metabolically healthy, I think you are generally in a better mood. You don't have the, the mood swings that, that come with carbs as well. You see it in children. You give kids sugar and they just go nuts. And I, if you're doing this all day long, you can't be a super duper pleasant person to be around. So I think my relationships have, have improved across the board just because I'm a far more even keel now, just in terms of, of mood. And it's just, it's hard to be angry when you, when your body feels good. Yeah, fair enough. When you're in, when you're in pain and suffering, whether it be an acute injury or illness or just this chronic, you know, people are in chronic pain all the time. It's, it is, it's hard to, you know, because you've got this background, this kind of pressure and stress on you at all times. And then just the littlest negative thing and you just fall to pieces. Whereas, yeah, I find that I'm very resilient. Bad things still happen. Life is life. It's not going to go away, but you could, you're able to just be absorb that and just go on and, and deal with it better. And I think a lot of, unfortunately, I think we're up with so many people that are so poorly nourished and it's showing up with, I, I talked to Georgie the other day. She said one in three, one in three young adults, like teens and young twenties are on a mental health drug for a mental health disorder. One out of three. Mm -hmm. It's like you got three, one out of three people's depressed or anxious or bipolar. That's becoming insane. And so, and, and nutrition clearly plays a role on that. And I think that's very interesting. Over well, the years, have you, you made any to, go ahead. Go I'm ahead, sorry, Steve. because I had my physical this morning and it's further depressing when you look at everybody that's in healthcare and they're all overweight. Not yeah. everybody. I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but the receptionist, the both nurses that, that came in and my doctor all overweight and it's in healthcare. How can you not see yourself and what you're eating is doing to you? You come in and you give me my tetanus booster and then you go and you eat a bagel. That's you're not a role model for health very often in the healthcare industry. As you look at these people. Yeah. I used to, when I did my residency, it was funny. I was orthopedic surgery and we did it at University of Texas down in Galveston. And three months of the year, we spent in the prison hospital because that's how we learned, right? We're operating on some prisoners, which is crazy, but we did that. But all of the nursing staff, with rare exception, was we used to joke around that they had a retirement plan that was either hit 300 pounds or 20 years, whichever came first, you get to retire. Mm -hmm. Well, they had a, we had a nurse, we called her a roller nurse. She literally never got out of her chair. She would, to code, she would roll over there to code. And it was just, it was funny. But yes, it's interesting. A lot of them will say, I have a stressful job. I have a stressful job and therefore, you know, that's causing me to be obese. Maybe I stress eat or something like that. And you go in a hospital and it's laden with junk food. Patients are bringing in cookies and donuts and drug reps are bringing all this crap in there. And it's, all the break room, physician break rooms, it's, it is, it's, it's always available. It's always available with junk food. And it is, you know, and, and that's why we have all these obese healthcare providers. So it's an interesting thing. Have you, I guess, as you've gone over the, obviously you've tested many products, now you're wearing a CGM, or, which makes it a lot easier. Can you say anything you've learned in general? Is there any kind of insight that you've discovered either about yourself or about things in general with doing all this testing? Boy, that's, I don't know that I have. I think the fact that it's taken me that long to come up with an answer, certain patterns. It's interesting to see, for example, the dawn effect. You, you can go through the day with your glucose in the 70s. Upper For me, it's generally upper 70s to maybe mid 80s on any given day. I look at 6.30, 7 in the morning, and you'll see, you'll see that spike right there. Your body's infusing a little bit of glucose into you to, to get you out of bed. So there's that. I think one of the things that I noticed, and, and this isn't uh, the CGM, actually, there is a little bit from the CGM. Like when I would drink and it could just be a couple of glasses of wine with dinner, when I would do that, not only would I see in the middle of the night, my glucose just plummet. Very often it would set off the alarm on the, the Dexcom app and wake me up at two, three in the morning. But I noticed from my sleep app that my heart rate is about 20 beats per minute faster. If I would have a, just a couple glasses of wine with dinner, my sleeping heart rate would go up. And when not drinking, it's 20 points lower. You learn, and, and these are things that I also, when I was initially 
thinking about diet. I'm like, oh, I can't give up beer. I can't give up alcohol. When you start finding that things that you think you love are mistreating you and mistreating your body, it gets a lot easier to, to give them up. Yeah, that's that that's absolutely you know clear for a lot of people. There, and there's other people that just either stop checking or they try to game it. I'm gonna I'm gonna find something that that is still garbagey but doesn't cause my blood glucose to spike. And clearly, there's going to be companies that make those products that are going to be tailored to the people that still want to eat junk and not make their so they can feel better about their glucose. You brought up an interesting sort of I think one of the things that I have seen many times over is when people go low carb ketogenic carnivore and many times they lose the desire to smoke cigarettes or to drink alcohol or to engage in you know other drugs or, or activities did you notice because you said vodka gimlets and beer did, did that go away a little bit for you or is that still you, you care about that as um, much anymore i i didn't really miss beer i managed to just because i, I realized that, that wasn't going to be keto there was no way to fit that in i found that hard liquor just didn't sit well with me when I was keto. I would it, I would have one sip of bourbon or something like that and almost immediately feel it. Hard liquor quit being a temptation. Dry wines, dry whites, dry reds. I got used to them. I, I looked at them as food. They were the accompaniment to m my meal. And so that I didn't lose the, the desire for. But I came to realize that it just, it wasn't serving me well. It, you know, I'm a better person not drinking than I am drinking. Tobacco, I haven't used tobacco since my son was about one year old and wanted to know what I was doing. And I, I was a uh, smokeless tobacco. The moment he like pointed and it's like, what's that? I'm like, that's getting dumped down the toilet. And that was the last day I, I dipped tobacco. And so that was 24 years ago. So don't, that's, that hasn't been a, a concern or something I miss. Yeah, good for you. That's uh, clearly not an uh, optimal habit for sure. Steve, we're, we're just about out of time. I've got to go jump over and do a couple consultations here in a second. But where, remind us the channel. If you're, if, do you have other social media as well? Is it mostly the YouTube channel or where, where so do people find you? We've got the Serious Keto channel on YouTube. It's keto.com is the website. And I designed my recipe pages to be what I would want to see. So very often you go out onto a, a recipe website and there's just pages and pages of text and all these pictures and Google AdSense, every other paragraph. I'm like, ah, just give me the recipe. Tell me the ingredients. Tell me how to make it. That's all I want. And ideally able to print it out on a single sheet of paper. So that's how I designed SeriousKeto.com. I've got an Instagram account. I don't post on that all that often. Facebook, I don't, I, there's there is a, it's called, I think it's Serious Keto Cooking because there's already some guy by the name of Keto. That was his name and he must be serious because that was, he's, he had that page locked down already. But to me, I just, I find the toxicity level on Facebook just not to my liking. Just everybody is such a keyboard warrior and it doesn't matter. I'm not talking specifically Keto or Carnivore. This Cast Iron Experts group and I've never seen so much toxicity, just how, how mean people are to each other. So I try and stay away from Facebook as much as possible. One other thing, because I know because you had not only were taught, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember seeing you reviewing not only various food products, but also kitchen gadgets and, and devices. Is that stuff you still have there so people can find out about the latest? Any Anytime I use any hardware that, that I think is special or useful or unique to that recipe. I will always include the links for them both on, on my website and on the description on my YouTube videos. There are some great products out there. I just, I'm into gadgets that I can't help myself. There are some that are, are wonderful and I would recommend to anybody to have in their kitchen. There are others that are more novelty type items, one trick pony type devices that, that I probably don't have room for, but I, I keep anyway. Very good. Yeah, I've got some nice grills, and I use them every dang day. So we'll see. This has I, been fun. It's fun my grill is underneath you. about two feet of snow right now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've got uh, a couple reports, report. so I'm pretty safe. And I'm, I'm up, and it doesn't snow much where I'm at. I'm, I'm up near Seattle, and, and so we don't get the – we're too close to the ocean to have – was temporized quite a bit from work. Cause I lived in the Midwest for many years. I grew up northern – 
Northwest Indiana, Chicago, and we used to dislike you probably getting in Wisconsin. Is sometimes you get dumped on. Steve, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Serious Keto, seriousketo.com. You guys check it out. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Steve.